focus on what you can change. You can't control how many orchestra jobs there are, what positions open. What you can control is what you do. Yeah. You know, so so your work ethic, your your depth in your studies, you know, if, if you really put your heart and passion out there and just hit it with everything you got, I think the, the world will make room for you. Welcome back to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. And I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm so happy to have you here with me listening to this show. And please visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. And I'd love to hear from you. Email me, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Tell me a little about yourself. Tell me your story. I love hearing people's stories. That's why I do this podcast. And I know you'll love today's story featuring Sander Ostland. And Sander teaches double bass at Baylor University. He was the first bassist to receive his DMA with Paul Ellison at Rice University. He's also got a killer solo album, Leap of Faith. And we're going to feature excerpts from this. You'll be hearing a little bit of the whole album, really. We'll just play a short excerpt from every piece. There are four pieces on this album, four original works for double bass. So you'll be hearing a bit from Scott McAllister. This is a concerto by Scott McAllister. Music for bass and percussion by Matthew Klein. A serial composition by Edward J.F. Taylor. And a short solo work by Francois Raboth, which is actually dedicated to Sandor. And Sandor and I talk about the recording of this album, going to some of the details, which I know you'll love. And also his early years, he's had such an amazing array of teachers. Hans Sturm was his first bass teacher. Then he stayed with Richard Davis, worked with Francois Raboth, where he met Paul Ellison and ended up doing his DMA with. He's also taught at several universities prior to Baylor, and he's an active clinician. He's also organizing the 2017 ISB solo competitions. He's overseeing that. So we talk about that, plus so many other topics, practicing, advice for students, and much more. Sanders a great guy, and this was such a fun conversation. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, D'Addario Strings, and let you know a little bit about their Zyx strings, which are synthetic core strings that produce an extremely warm, rich sound. They're made from a new generation of synthetic material that are incredibly stable under drastic climactic conditions. So they settle in on the instrument in just a few hours, and they produce rich, gut-like, complex tone combined with power and clarity for both pizzicato and arco playing. The Zyx bass strings were developed primarily to offer outstanding pizzicato attacks and sustain, as well as superb bowing response. So get the sound and the feel of gut strings with more evenness, projection, and stability than real gut. And thanks again, D'Addario, for sponsoring these podcasts. And I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Sander Osland. <laughs> Start with your early years in music. What was your first musical instrument? Yeah, in fifth grade, I started with the viola. Viola, um, really? Yep. Okay, yep. wow. And, and that didn't stick. <laughs> so I, I played that for one year, and in sixth grade, I switched to the saxophone. Okay. Which was cool, and I liked it, okay? And it wasn't until I was early high school, like a sophomore or so, that my band director was just a great band director named John Georgeson. He brought in a jazz duo as artists in residence. Mm hmm. And this, this guy named John Gibson had a fretless electric bass he was playing. And, and I, I, from that moment on, I just knew that was it. Wow. You know, it was just one of these things where that, that, that's what I want to do. Oh, cool. So did then you then pick up the, the electric? Is that, Imme is that immediately? So I oh, remember nice. going up to him after, you know, the clinic and the, the concert they did. And I said, what are your strings called? You know, <laughs> he's like EADG. And I, you know, chartered it out. And I was, I remember going to history class the next and not paying any attention to anything else anymore. Just, you know, trying to figure out if I put my first finger here, what would that be? And nice. all that sort of stuff. 
So just super hooked on it from the start. Yeah. I think a lot of us have been there in other classes. Like I remember I used to, yeah. my, my teacher will ask me to stop fingering through passages during math class, right. you know? Yeah. That whole <laughs> mental practice thing starts early. You know, it, it's, it's neat. You it know? does. I think you're the first person I've ever talked to who's told me viola to saxophone, saxophone yeah, yeah. to <laughs> electric bass. That's, a, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was a weird, but it was just when the bass hit, that, that was it. And even before the bass, I had this feeling I wanted to be a professional musician. Yeah. You know, I don't know why and, and what I was going to do, but, but the bass was sort of the vehicle oh, for cool. that. So, you know, I was learning. I remember, you know, I had a, a Regatta de Blanc record by the police, you uh-huh. know, so I'm learning how to play Message in a Bottle and Walking on the yeah. Moon just by ear and on a record and then scratching it and stuff like that. Yeah. But then starting to read jazz charts and just locking myself in the room and, and, and loving it. Oh, cool. When did the upright enter the picture for you? Very soon after that. So yeah. it was just sort of, I think, you know, I was in the band room yeah. involved with a jazz band and they kind of walked next door and saw an upright bass. I said, oh, that's where this whole thing was really pointing, you yeah. know? So I remember taking, I, I asked the orchestra director, can I borrow this? And she said, yeah. And I just, again, put myself in a practice room, tried to figure out what was going on. And very soon thereafter, realized I didn't have a clue. So I was plucking away, trying to do some of the jazz stuff. And so I got the name of a teacher, and it was, it was Hans Sturm. I mean, he was working on his, his um, master's at University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I, I got his number, I called him, and he was my first teacher. Oh, get out of here. That's great. So, yeah. Wow. So it was great. I remember walking into the lesson and just saying, you know, excited to be here and his bass and all this stuff. I cannot figure out how to make out a sound with a bow. <laughs> You know, I'm putting the bow on the string and it's just blank. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. And I'm looking at these people around me making sound and it's like miraculous. <laughs> so he pulls out this little red container. He's just like, <laughs> here's the first thing you need. So we put a swipe of pops on. I was like, oh, that's that's how y'all do it. You oh, know? that's great. So, yeah. <laughs> well, fascinating that Hans would be your first teacher. I'd love to know what, because I, I know Han, we both, you know, I know Hans as well. And like what yeah. he's into in terms of pedagogy. What did he start you on? Did he start you on Samandal? Did he get, what, what were those early lessons like? Oh, wow. That's way back. I remember uh, Samandal. I was uh-huh. in the book one Samandal. I had yeah. 30 etudes. Yeah. Um, and the, the Vivaldi sonatas. Okay. Okay. You know, okay. those, that's, that's what I remember. I'm sure we did other stuff. I know we did modes and scales and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's really even, even then sort of thinking yeah. all encompassing, but yeah. yeah, that was the material. When you ended up at UW Madison, right? Mm-hmm. With, yep. with, with Richard. With Richard Davis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was, what was that like studying with Richard? Richard. I mean, first of all, just to reflect on the, on the life and career he's had. Yeah. I mean, just as a person who's, who's influenced so many people as a musician, as a teacher, as a, as a racial activist, you know, mm-hmm. just really incredible. And, and it's, it's neat to kind of honor him, you know, yeah. as he's, he's retired from his position yeah. after, after so many years. But I, I feel really privileged to have studied with him. Remember the first lesson, you know, he was on the phone. He walked in and says, oh, go try that bass. It was Jimmy Blanton's bass in the corner. Uh, wow. So you just get a th- and you play one note on that. It's just thunderous it was just amazing and just imagine that was driving the ellington big band and all that stuff it's was pretty cool well he's got i mean just one of those you you start to read his resume and you you start to just like the the enormity of his impact in the music world i mean wasn't he downbeats i forget what the statistic is but jazz basses of the year like pretty much every year for that decade that amazing yeah yeah, and throughout the 60s and 70s he was just it so just great he he was super open-minded anything Mm -hmm you brought to him. It wasn't, you know, that's not how we do it. He's like, let's figure this out. And I actually remember once um, in a used CD store, I found Edgar Meyer's work in progress, mm-hmm. that, that, that CD. And I was just, I brought it to him and we're like, wow, you know, it's just, you know, yeah. mind blowing to hear that. And I said, I've decided to change my tuning. I will now tune like <laughs> Edgar Meyer's, you know, so, <laughs> so for, for actually a year and a half or so, I tuned EBEA, you, you know, did. just solo tuning on the top three strings. And he didn't yeah. bat an eye. He yeah. just, he says, what's that again? He wrote it down on a note and filed it and says, all right, let's go. So I was learning orchestral repertoire like that. Just, you know. that's I've always been so fascinated in how Edgar does that because you still have the complete range of the instrument, but you have then you have the characteristics of those solo strings. I mean, if you did that for a year, you must have started to think of the bass in that tuning. Like if you Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. Because yeah. I think most of us, when we just put on solo strings, we're still, we're transposing, right? right. But you must have, if you were going to play Beethoven 9, you'd be playing, you know. Just playing everything. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was, it was, and now when I go back, if I ever play solo strings, it's, I think of it like a normal bass and sure. it's just a different sound happening. But at the time that's, I was reading music like that and he was happy to support that. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Um, so just, just an amazing, I mean, I, I, so much experience that he was able to pass on. And, and yeah. like I said, that open mind was, was really cool. You yeah. know? And, and speaking of the, the wide breadth of experience, he had this, I remember I was making my CV for, you know, or resume or whatever. 
And he says, here, here's mine, just as a point of reference. And, you know, it's like a book, you know, it's like 50 <laughs> pages long and everyone's played with. And I remember looking at him like, man, you forgot Louis Armstrong, you know, like you have Miles Davis and Eric Dolphy and Bruce Springsteen. I was like, you, you forgot Louis Armstrong, you, you know, like because I had a record with him on it. I'm like, how do you forget Louis Armstrong? You know, it's just there aren't many people that would be leaving out Louis Armstrong. You're right, right. <laughs> At that point, projecting yourself a few years in the future, what were you thinking of career-wise? Were you the whole thing? Like I knew from the beginning, I wanted to be a university professor. Really? Okay, that's exactly. Okay. So what I was hoping to get was sort of a, a big toolbox. Yeah. So and I think maybe it had to do with studying with Hans early on because that's mm-hmm. sort of the trajectory he seemed to be on. Mm-hmm. Um, so Richard's thing was the phone rang and you said yes. Yeah. You know, and for me that really resonated because I wanted to I wanted to be able to do everything. Yeah. I love that line. That's a great line. The phone yeah. rang. And, 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 and for yes. him, I think that's yeah. true, you know. So I mean he he was in New York and just doing everything. Yeah. Well, because I mean with somebody like because he had that symphonic experience. He right. had he was playing those those great orchestras what, right. as well. Very cool. So where did life take you after Madison? So Hans actually called me up and said, you know, this guy, Francois Raboth, is going to be in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I think he's offering some lessons. Try to get a hold of him. So it was at the end of my UW-Madison tenure there. And so I, ca- I called this this guy who was arranging the lessons and set up a lesson and met Francois there. And that's sort of set the new trajectory for me. Yeah. What was that? Do, can you remember that first experience meeting Francois? Because I mean, for a lot of people, it's yeah. like mind mind blowing it was it actually started out really poorly oh really? Um, yeah and, and through my own fault i was in madison i had to drive down to chicago so i stayed the night in chicago i'd gotten directions but somehow it's before google maps and iphones and stuff you know i was supposed to take a right and i wrote down left or whatever it was so i'm racing around the suburbs of chicago like just lost so it ends up i, I think i'm like an hour late to this lesson and I was just going to walk in hand the money and say i really i'm sorry i don't mean any disrespect i just got lost all that sort of thing just devastated. I'm sweating, you know, my heart's pounding, all this, you know, I just felt like my whole life had been ruined. You know, what did I do? What an idiot. (laughs) So I walk in the door and they kind of look and said, you know, what happened? And I explained to them, they said, well, sit down, we'll do a lesson. You know, so they let me calm down. I had a drink of water and I ended up playing for Francois and it ended up being the best thing in the world. That was the last lesson of the day. So I'm playing um, straight end pin, just sort of, you know, very Gary Carr inspired, Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's Mm -hmm. how I'd been teaching myself and Richard been teaching me. And play the prelude to the second cello suite. And it's all up and down the G string. Just everything anti-Francois. Right. Like everything was, you know, in solo tuning with, you know, the Edgar's tuning yeah. there and all that sort of thing. So it's just everything that uh, Francois does, I was doing the opposite of. <laughs> but he was so sweet and just kind of taking me through the pivots and why his fingering choices were different and why he doesn't, you know, prefer the solo tuning versus the orchestra tuning. It's just everything. It's kind of laying his framework and groundwork. Yeah. So we finished the lesson which is fantastic. And, and that's, you know, where your mind kind of explodes because everything's just, wow, you know, different sounds and different fingerings, different ideas. And he says like, well, it's lunchtime. How about you have lunch with us? So I was able to sit down and have lunch with them, which I wouldn't have had if I hadn't been late and yeah. all this stuff. And so as, over lunch, he's like, I'd like you to come study in Paris with me. And I, I was just like, yeah, I, I've got to make this happen. It doesn't sound like too shabby a prospect either, like taking some time to go to Paris and uh, work with. No. What was that experience like going and working with Francois over there? It was magical. I tell you, like, I, I don't have words for it. It was just really life changing in so many ways. Bass playing with him is, is amazing. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. having the chance to study with him, he's, he's um, as a teacher, he, he's hard, mm-hmm. you know, just so thorough, so detailed. So, I mean, at the end of the lesson, he's like, why you make the bass do that? What's, <laughs> you know, just everything. You know? <laughs> and I'm playing German bow and as well as studying French bow with him too. But just every, every millimeter counted, you yeah. know. And so you're, you're finished with the lesson and you're just physically and mentally and spiritually just exhausted. And he'd look up at you with a big smile and say, coffee? <laughs> so it just, and, and then everything was nice and kind and we'd go sip Turkish coffee together and wait till next time. Oh, that's great. So, and obviously being in Paris is a pretty incredible experience.
when did you first meet Paul Ellison? Yeah, that's great. Um, it was at the end, my last lesson with Francois. Mm -hmm. So when I was studying with him, I was working on the third book. We went through all the etudes and scales in the third book and the first two cello suites primarily. And so the last lesson, it was going to be a playthrough of the, the second cello suite. Mm -hmm. And so this guy, Paul Ellison, shows up and he sits down the whole time. And that's sort of, it, again, just sort of the, this path that just seemed preordained or something like that. Yeah. It was so we had this lesson, great lesson with both Francois, you know, sort of the final one with him. And it's just great input from Paul. At that point, Paul and I just felt like we had a great connection from the mm -hmm. beginning. So we, we, I remember after that lesson, he and I sat in Francois's kitchen for a couple hours. And at that point, sort of mapped out the next five, six years of my life, wow. you know, like coming to Rice, getting a master's, getting a doctorate. So, so what I was doing was so closely aligned to what his interests were. Yeah. You know, knowing I wanted to go and be a university teacher, I wanted to do all the solo stuff and orchestral work and, and stuff like that. So it was, it was wonderful. You know, Paul, just why, and I've never had the privilege of studying with him, but I've seen him in master classes. And the, the, per, the first, if I compare, and again, not from having the weekly experience with Paul, I see him teach and he reminds me a lot of how Yo-Yo Ma teaches in yeah. a certain way. And it's, it's that like every new person, it's like a blank, it's like a blank slate. He doesn't have some preconception of how, here's how I teach this technique or this. I mean, yeah. maybe he has some of that, but it's like, talk about this. Why do you play that phrase? How, why do you put, what, talk to me I, about your thought. I, I did, it's just such a beautiful way of, of, teaching i mean like what yeah. first comes to your mind when you when you think about studying with paul you know i i feel like i feel so close to that man yeah you know yeah. And, I, and i feel like you know i was the first one to go through a doctorate with yeah. him and i just felt he was super invested mm -hmm. in me as, as mm -hmm. a bass player and, and as a person in my time there it wasn't sort of a traditional route we were exploring as much i mean whether it's early music orchestral techniques you know, Bach cello suites, you know, with mm -hmm. period bows, crazy Frank Proto pieces, just extended techniques, weird end pins, whatever it was. It yeah. was just, it felt like we were exploring this new world together. Yeah. You know, yeah. and he's obviously the guide, but, but it was just an honor to get to, to do that with him, yeah. you know? So I look back on those days really fondly and still do. I get to get him back to Houston. And I love hanging out with him and yeah. seeing what the latest and greatest is and having some coffee with him. I love the image of you going in, you know, in the stress of Chicago traffic, like trying to like get there and like you're lost and you come in and then you've got a straight end pin and you're playing, were you saying German yeah. bow? So yeah, yeah. yeah, like you said, it's yeah, like yeah. everything, if there was a Roboff checklist, <laughs> it would be right. like, not, I broke number not, one. Not, not, <laughs> <laughs> what have you settled on these days, just in terms of gear? Like what are you, what are you using yeah. right now? Right now, I have two bases that I use primarily. One's um, a Daniel Hatch's bass. Yeah. It's actually the first Dan Hatch's bass that was made. So that was um, made when I was at Rice. Yeah. Um, and that was an exciting day. I, I remember just the bass studio shut down for the day and people from the Houston Symphony were bringing their instruments in and kind of comparing. Because Dan, Dan Hatch's was the guy who was building all our extensions and yeah. repairing our instruments, yeah. you know. So, um, so that's been my orchestra bass since 97. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that. I have a Christian Labrie bass that mm -hmm. was made in about 2000, I believe. That's my solo bass. So that's a copy of Francois Kenwall. Mm -hmm. Then I have a, a bunch of bows, yeah. you know, which is always fun. I just got a, um, a Robert Dow. Oh, know, really? Orchestra bow and a, a Frechner and a Nuremberger and a Grumberger and, and a Lucci and yeah. a bunch of uh, period bows and stuff like that. So, Oh, cool. That's great. Yeah. Well, I just love it. my my stand partner in the in a chamber orchestra I played in Memphis for years and years has a, has a hatches. I mean, just such a tremendous instrument. How cool that that was the first one. It was the first one, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was, and and he he had it right from the beginning. I mean, all the setup stuff, all that really thoughtful stuff he was doing that he still, you know, his bases still have was there from the beginning. So it's neat. Yeah. Was Baylor your first college? John, no, 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 no. You, where'd you end up first? So I, I was, as I was finishing my doctorate with Paul, I ended up at West Texas A&M and, yeah. and Amarillo, Texas, where David mm -hmm. Murray used to teach. So that was oh, my first nice. job there, which was um, great. It was, it was great because of walking out of school straight into a, a professorship like that was really awesome. Yeah. What's something maybe, you know, all sorts of different people listen to this podcast, but a lot of people that are kind of trying to figure out careers, career options, you know, what's out there for them. Maybe just talk about what's something unexpected that the path you took and ended up going into university teaching. What's maybe something you found surprising in that first job at, at well, a and Yeah, the first job. I mean, obviously, we're thinking more entrepreneurship and there's so many professional development things that we're thinking of as university teachers now at, at that time, at least for me, it was just learn how to play your instrument. Yeah. 
You know, so, so walking out of that, I remember right before the audition or interview for that job, Larry Ratcliffe and Paul sat me down and just said, like, here's what a college audition or interview looks like. Mm-hmm. Here's the people you're going to be talking to. Here's what you should wear. Here's what you should say. Here's, you know, be prepared to talk about these sort of things. Mm-hmm. So, which is great because they, they were they were very accurate. So, I wasn't surprised talking to provosts and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, once I got the job, I had to teach music theory in, in a music appreciation class, which I had not thought about any of that stuff at all for years. I didn't care. You know? <laughs> I, I knew enough to you know, do what I had to do. So it was, I had to go reinvent the wheel for myself, you know? So, and, and that's something that I think a lot of people find themselves doing in a position like that. In fact, I interviewed David Murray and we were talking about, yeah. he was teaching, and I think this is while he's been at Butler, he taught a music appreciation class. And it was one of those things that ended up being incredibly satisfying for him, like reaching kind of a more general population than that special. What, what was that like teaching, teaching one of those classes? I've never, I've never had the, Privilege, if you call it a privilege. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoyed doing it while I was doing it. I think it was fun and it was fun talking to these other people and, and, and studying Beethoven in a different way than I had and, and yeah. trying to be able to communicate it, it, it in a way that other people would understand and, and be interested in. I don't know if I was that great at it. And, mm-hmm. you know. And really, I, I'm glad, you know, right now I don't have to do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very fortunate, you know. What's a day in the, well, actually, let's, let's maybe just a little bit about Baylor. Did, it was Baylor where you ended up after, after A&M? Yeah, after, after that, I went to um, Shenandoah Conservatory. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. And, and Donovan Stokes is out yeah. there now. Yeah. So out, out in Virginia, which, yeah. which was cool. It, it was a lot of fun because near DC. So there's a lot of great work to do out there and a lot mm-hmm. of um, period work like Baroque. Gut string and, you know, oh, Bach cool. B minor masses and cathedrals and, and stuff yeah. like that. So a lot of fun out there. Well, what's a, what's a week in the life of a Baylor music professor? What's your, what's your day-to-day life look like right now? Yeah, it's, it's, I love it. I mean, yeah. it, it was interesting being at um, Shenandoah. I just got a call from Baylor and said, you know, we got your name, come apply and audition and all that stuff. So I did. And it's just what they did was just say, build a base pro, just Build what you think is a great base program. There wasn't a lot of, you have to do this or that. It was just do what you think is right. That's great. Yeah, yeah. it's a real blessing. I mean, just, I mean, <laughs> so the students that we do the, the lessons, obviously, yeah. we do uh, orchestral repertoire class every week. We do a master class, like a solo class every week, just so they can practice some and get used to performing in mm-hmm. public. Currently, we're doing two technique classes. So, you know, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, we're just going through like domain for say style sort of scale oh. and technique work. Great. Uh, oh, that's great. And some bass ensemble work. And then, of course, they have orchestra and all the other stuff that goes along with music school. Nice. So it's, it's really beautiful. And, and, and it for me, like I think of myself as, as you know, my, my models with Paul and Francois, because you go and see them, something's new. They've, yeah. they've figured something new out. They developed something. They've made something easier. So that, you know, not only are they masters, but they're eternal students. So those, those are the sort of role models that, that you want to have. Well, and uh, you, you look at those two players. And I mean, Paul is, as we're talking right now, is I think 75, Rabat's 85. Yeah. And they're still playing, I mean, at such, a, such an amazing level. I mean, that alone says something about that approach that you can yeah, be. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Yeah. And every every time you go visit either one of them, they're so excited to, sh- you know, just look what my second finger does if I press it this way or, or you know, whatever, yeah. my new bow hair or whatever it is. It's just there's still that love for the instrument and the music making. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's fun. So for me, you know, I get here early in the morning and I'm trying to like fill up my sponge, you know, like and continually grow and you know, practicing and listening and, and just so I want to make sure I have stuff to share. Yeah. yeah. Continually. And that's for the rest of our lives. We get to do that. And I consider that a real blessing and privilege to do that. Let's say you had, and you know, life life gets busier as you get older, and you get more tra- and and practice time shrinks. And let's just say you had an hour these yeah. days to practice. What what would you do? I go, you know, I've done the the you know uh, variations of of you know like Rabat's scale routine mm-hmm. for years. And so what we did for you when I was studying with him and at Rise was the two hours just nonstop. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't have two hours, what I've tried to do is, is do a lot of the scales, do a lot of double stops. And I have a, a slew of just exercises and technique stuff that, that just seem to like distill 
Yeah. Like, like you know, yeah. Like no, exactly. Just, yeah. So in an hour, I feel like I can get really tired, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that changes according to what I feel like my needs or the, what music I'm playing, whether it's a lot of orchestral work or a solo recital coming up, sort of thing like that. But it's sort of based in that the endurance scales that France always having us do. So I, I just felt a lot of benefit for that. Just, you know, your body gets relaxed because you're tired, mm-hmm. you know, so you have to do things right. So you don't get tired and so you can handle that, you know, and just approach things physically so, so perfectly. You know, I, it's such a great concept, and it's something that I still think a lot of people don't really totally understand. And I think it if it, it has a lot of parallels to uh, martial arts practice, too, yeah. the way that they warm up. It might be interesting just to kind of dive into why why is that beneficial? Why shouldn't you just get out the bass and start, like, you know, tune and start, like, banging out some Beethoven 5? Like, why should I practice an hour or two of scales in right. that way, you know? like <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think Hal had the, you know, he calls it abstract technique. Yeah. Yeah. Where where you, where the, you you can do the string crosses, you can you know where the notes go, you know how you know your hand is shaped. All that stuff is is done away from the piece you're playing or the music you're working on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the two hours just allows you to focus awareness on on from stance to you know how bow hold and and bow changes and and you know left hand position or your shoulders even just a, a, you know anything you can think of and and you really have time and the luxury of time to think of every detail mm-hmm. you know so that when you come to the the, the beethoven five or, or whatever it is you're, you're not worried about the instrument you're worried about the music and that's really the goal and i think francois you know says all the technique in the world is worth one perfect note and yeah. you know like we're trying to get the technique so so the notes can come out you know and not you know we don't have to worry about that anymore mm-hmm what do you find and you get you're getting a continual fresh batch of students coming in at 18 what what do you find people tend to struggle with the most on the instrument yeah. that's it you know I, I almost take it away from the instrument a little bit and, uh-huh. and and like sort of going from the big to the small and and the big to me is is the why like why are we doing what we're doing so you know mm-hmm. so if we have our mission statement in front of us the whole time you know so when a freshman comes in talking about goals and not just results, you know, mm-hmm. they could say, I want to be in a big five orchestra. And I don't want that to be just about, I need a paycheck and a steady living. So what's your passion? What's your dream? What, what are we shooting for? What's going to get you out of bed in the morning every day? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think I, I heard someone say that, um, Martin Luther King Jr. said, um, he didn't say I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. Nice. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, mm-hmm. so we have to have that dream, not just a plan so that we have the why, why, what we're doing and then not get stuck on the, the hows and what's as much, mm-hmm. you know? So just really focusing that every morning you're able to wake up and, and you feel like you're one step closer to your ultimate goal. Yeah. No, I love that. That's great. So I had, I had one student who, who, when he was here, he never missed 40 hours a week. Not wh- whether he gave a recital or whether he went on vacation, which is just insane, but you just, he had that why so clear in his head what he wanted to do. And it was just really powerful to see that. It's a little crazy, but it was really powerful to see that. Yeah. You know? Orchestra jobs are not really increasing (laughs) year by year. They're either staying steady or going down. And that's such a common goal that people have, I find, walking into music school. And you had a slightly different goal uh, with university jobs, but obviously that's an incredibly challenging path as well. What, What kind of career advice do you give these young people that are that are coming into school just in terms of finding their own way in in the music world and you talked about the the having a dream and that's so powerful what how do you kind of guide them through this this world that we're yeah, seeing here it's interesting like i i try to tell like focus on what you can change you can't control how many orchestra jobs there are or what positions open what you can control is what you do yeah you know, so, so your work ethic, your, your depth in your studies, you know, if, if you really put your heart and passion out there and just hit it with everything you got, I think the, the world will make room for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, and ultimately that's what you have to be doing it for the right reasons. Right. You know, I remember I spent a summer with David Walter and he said, um, if you can imagine doing something else, do it. It's, it's, it's easier. Yeah. 
You know, and we have to, I think Larry Rackliff says, we have to love this more than it's hard. I just yeah. love that. Love it more than it's hard, you know, because you have to be, you have to be persistent and just diligent and yeah. just want it. Well, and talk about somebody that w- persistent and want it and work ethic, like Larry Radcliffe. My yeah, there's word. no one like him. Yeah. 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 yeah I, no one like him. I've done a fair amount of conducting the last few years and he was yep. like a huge influence. He has some, there's some grainy video from the 80s or early 90s on on YouTube of him talking to a group of music educators and just about how to structure. And it was just amazing to listen to what he does and to prepare a piece. And I mean, and you can see the results. He knows that music. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anyone who knows a score better than he does. Yeah. And and talk about someone. I mean, he was he was up before any of us working on his scores, practicing in front of mirrors, all that stuff. So however hard we are working at Rice, he was 10 times more than that. I just interviewed yesterday, actually, Shinji Ishima, who's one of the San Francisco opera bassists, awesome. taught tons of people here yeah. in the Bay Area, and he studied with David Walter. And what a, what an incredible musician and what an impact. There's somebody, I wish I'd started this podcast decades oh, ago man. and I could have yeah. talked to him, but maybe- You could have just had the David Walter podcast. I, know, I mean, you I just know. give him the mic and let him go. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> what were some takeaways from those experiences like working with that? Incredible First, musician. again, I mean, he was older when I, I worked with him in 94 and still just loved music and loved the bass, mm-hmm. just passionate about what he was doing, curious about what was going on. Yeah. You know, so I've just been starting messing around with the robust stuff and he just wanted to know why the bent end pin, what are you doing? And mm-hmm. just really fascinated by it all. And Paul used to say he's, he's forgotten more than we'll ever know. <laughs> you know, it just, he said, what's your, your ancestor i said mostly norwegian and yeah. he says like do you, do you know norwegian i said no he's like well learn it what's wrong with you <laughs> like and for him he, he would have learned norwegian and, and as well as a host of other languages just so bright and so intelligent and and musical it just being around him was really special I'd love to hear a little bit about your role with the upcoming ISB convention. What's what's uh, and you're in charge of the competitions. Yeah, right? the performance competitions. The performance competitions. Yeah, what's that what's that going to look like? It should be really neat. I have some some great people. So what what I do is I sort of umbrella all the performance competitions and there's chairs for the the different parts. We have mm-hmm. David Murray who's doing the solo competition, Hans Sturm is doing the jazz competition, Jessica Valls is doing the 14 and under, mm-hmm. Leon Bosch is doing 15 to 18 nice. and Ali Osdenfar um, from Montreal is going to do our orchestral competition. Oh, great. So so at this point we've we've picked repertoire, so I kind of oversee that and give them sort of the guidelines and they send back the repertoire like that. I think it's going to be fantastic. What The thing I'm really excited about right now is I was able to help facilitate the required piece mm-hmm. for the solo competition. So I asked Francois to write a piece. No, really? Um, that's yeah, great. So that's oh, going to cool. be the required solo. So it was due January 1st. I already have a rough draft. He was, he was so excited to write oh, it. Beautiful. Um, and just I think it's a really fitting celebration for the 50th yeah. anniversary of the ISB to have him do that for us. And the piece is beautiful. I remember, you know, I said it should usually it's unaccompanied and three to five minutes long. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he gives me the rough draft. He says it's six and a half minutes long. Is that OK? I just couldn't cut anything. It's too good. You know, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 we'll take it. That'll be, <laughs> there'll be more work for them, but it, it, it's worth it. Well, so. what a cool contribution because there have been so many great pieces that have come out yeah. of that. What a cool role to be able to like bring this new bass repertoire into the world. Right, right. I'm I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I think I mean these competitions just help. You know, you, you hate to think about music as a competition, you know, but at the same time, I, I think there's a lot of benefit to this, and, and it just helps us grow as an instrument, as a, as, as a community, and just kind of seeing what the instrument can do and keep pushing those boundaries. Um, it's really exciting. Yeah, absolutely, and it brings these interesting artists to light that you just might that might be the they might not have come out if there hadn't been a venue for yeah. that. You know? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly, I just listened to your Sam Suggs yeah. um, pod, and it was fascinating. Just beautiful, beautiful work he's doing and how he thought about approaching that. Mm-hmm. His, his competition round was, was really fascinating. Yeah, so yeah. It's exciting. For sure. Oh, 
<laughs> Just tell me a little bit about your album. Okay. So, so I did a record called Leap of Faith. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago and it started, I, I play for whatever reason, I played a lot of chamber orchestra, mm -hmm. um, which I love. I just I really enjoyed that. So this group was the river Oaks chamber orchestra down in Houston. So Rocco, mm -hmm. we call it. And they invited me to play a, a concerto with them. And so I took the opportunity to have one commissioned. Mm -hmm. So there's a composer named Scott McAllister here at Baylor who, who wrote the concerto for me. We premiered that I think in 2010. So it just started, that was sort of the, the first piece of, of this puzzle from, from there. I had a student who, commissioned another piece and we were kind of working on that together this this 12 tone atonal but beautiful beautiful piece just very hardcore serial piece oh cool but r r really neat yeah you know like so thoughtful when you when you hear how it's described and the arches and all that sort of thing you're just there's a whole nother level of genius happening that i can't even comprehend yeah. and then i did a third piece with uh written by a student of mine named matt klein mm -hmm. who who later won the isb solo uh composition contest oh so one of the things i've had several students here who who were love playing bass and are, are talented like he is very talented double bass players but they're also interested in composition and so one of the things i challenged him to do was write me a piece so he wrote a really cool piece for uh double bass and percussion that we, that we recorded in this percussion just has a wall i mean there's like 200 instruments just surrounding this poor percussionist in the middle there <laughs> um so I, I wanted to record those just because they were sort of orbiting me at that time so i, I recorded all three of those and then when Francois put out book four, one of the pieces um, or etudes or whatever, it was, it was dedicated to me. So I wanted to, I happened to play on a recital and there's mistakes all over it. And I totally screw up the middle part, but I put that on there too. Just, you know, because it was, <laughs> sure. I had it just like, why not? You yeah. Know? So it, it was a lot of fun recording that and editing it on Pro Tools and going to a mastering and, you know, figuring all that stuff out. So it was a cool. lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Did, you, did you edit it yourself? Did you do yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, you learn a lot about your playing and just the whole editing process and everything. Absolutely. Doing that. Yeah. And it's and for like the percussion piece, the floor would creak slightly. Oh. So if he had like a, you know, a cowbell over here and a triangle over here, we had to like hit the cowbell, pause, retake, hit the triangle <laughs> just because it'd be a, you know, in the yeah. stage. <laughs> yeah. Just straight and all that. So you have to figure <laughs> out how to do all that. And so it was a lot of fun. Just that learning curve was neat. Oh, cool. So, yeah. yeah. I, I remember going in for the first time for a Pro Tools session. And I was just playing some singer songwriter thing. And like, yeah. just remember how humbling and sort of like listening back. He's like, oh yeah, we'll just move that A just a little bit right, right, that right. there. Like, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an endless world. The yeah. Pro Tools. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. I always like to, I'm always curious what people have to say about if you could go back and give 20 year old Sandor some, some advice now, knowing what you know now, what would you say? Uh, looking back, I made a ton of mistakes, you yeah. know, I don't know, like learning orchestral repertoire, a whole step off. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah, that's going to scar you for life. Yeah, and, and I, so I, I think it's okay now, but it wasn't the most efficient path. Yeah. Certainly it wasn't the most efficient path. At the same time, I was kind of happy to go kind of a circuitous route, yeah. you know, and figuring stuff out. And, and, you know, Richard in particular, let me kind of skate around stuff. And I think I had some of this naturally, like I, I would practice hard. I had, I had that sort of inherent mm -hmm. um, and being willing to kind of lock myself in the practice room and, and hearing stories of Richard that was eight hours a day. And, yeah. you know, then you hear like all his friends, Dolphy and all these people who were just like, so I was just like, I want to be like that. Yeah. So I, I think the hard work Part of it is important. I, I think w one of the things I, I wish I had thought of is that my professional life started the minute I walked into to university mm. you know, and yeah, really thinking like th these people are the people I might be working with in the future and really thinking, you know, that it's not just about how well you play the instrument. It's about how you, you interact with the people around you and the music making and, and making opportunities like that. So a, a bigger awareness of that, I think, is, is important now. And it would have been good for me then, I think. Yeah. What a great way to put it. Your professional life starts. I was interviewing someone recently. His, his line is, the real world starts when you say it does. And that should be right yeah. now. But I think it's such an easy thing for students to sort of forget. Yeah. Um, but really, it's a small world. This is right. 
<laughs> right. And so you know, I'm talking to my students now. We're talking about, you know, like get a resume together, like gig etiquette, you know, like h- how you're going to approach this gig and answering emails yeah. quickly so the contractor's not worried about you or whatever it is that, that they're highly functional yeah. in, in a professional world, you know. Yeah. So it's not just about how you play anymore. Right. You know? yeah. Right. Thanks again, Sander, for the great interview. So great to talk with you. And folks, check him out online at sanderosland.com. And thanks again for listening to this episode. I know Sander appreciates it. I appreciate it. And I'm so thrilled to have you along in this journey with all of us. This is the community podcast for the double bass world. And I'd love to have you be a part of it as much as possible. So Email me, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. Reach out on social media, Facebook, Twitter, I'm all over the place there. Just look for ContraBase Conversations. Share this with a friend. Do you have somebody that you would like to let know about Sandra and what he's up to, that awesome solo album? Let them know. Forward this to a friend. Email it. Share it on Facebook, whatever. Really appreciate that. And that's how this show grows. And I'd love it if you have any guest ideas, let me know. If you have any news coming up, if you have any events coming up, let me know. I will spread the word. That's what I'm here to do. And I'm having such a great time being in that role. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We will see you again very soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm.